Hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming out to our presentation. Um, today we'll be discussing uh, Kansas City Power and Light most recent transformational pro uh, uh, program. Um, Forrest Archibald is going to join me here. He's going to be my co-presenter. Co uh, let me tell you a little bit about Forrest. Uh, Forrest works for Kansas City Power and Light. Uh, Forrest has over 15 years of experience working for utilities. Uh, that experience actually spans from building multi-billion multi power plants to most recently leading the organization through a large transformational, business transformational uh, program. The program was really aimed at providing the utilities customers a better customer experience by providing more services, by providing more options, and also at the same time uh, making sure that the utilities in operation optimize and modernize their, uh, their operation. The project we're gonna to talk to you about is called the One CIS. So for those of you who don't know what a CIS stands for, CIS stands for Customer Information System. So when you think about utilities, right? We all deal with utilities on a daily basis. When you think about utilities, there are three major functions that they, that, that they perform. Number one, they generate energy, and that's we call that generation. Number two, they transmit and distribute that energy. We call that transmission and distribution. And number three, they sell that energy. So think about, when you think about a CIS, is the part that deals with the customer, is the part that deals with selling that energy. So as I like to put it, it's really the billing engine and the cash register uh, for the utility. So with that, please uh, help, me, uh, help me welcome Forrest to the stage. Forrest, can you please join us? Good to see you, Mr. Bear. Good to see you. So I imagine uh, most of us here, if not everyone in this room, actually interacts uh, with our utilities at some capacity, right? And probably, um, you know, expectations from everyone here, what that level of interaction, what that is, it differs. Absolutely. Some of us here just want to pay our bills once a month and make sure that uh, the power is there when we need it that we rely on the utilities whenever there's a, there's a storm, whenever there's a, an event, mm -hmm. that they're there, sort of like the lights on type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. While other people really want their utility, they expect a lot more from the utilities. Um, they want their utilities to provide green services. We yep. see that a lot today, uh, renewables, yep. solar, wind energy, and so forth. Also energy advice, correct? Right? Energy surveys, um, you know, how am I doing with energy? data insights into their consumption, uh, more flexibility in terms of programs, uh, payment arrangements, uh, flexible rates, mm -hmm. uh, time of use rates, all these terms that we hear all the time, right? Day in and day out. So, um, so but utilities are also not only facing uh, pressures from their customers, but they're also facing a lot of pressure from their regulators, right? Absolutely. Regulators are wanting utilities to do more and more uh, every day, and the driver for that is really technology. Correct. Right? When we talk about technology, uh, technology has come a long way. Yes, it has. Uh, and today, we, quite frankly, we're accustomed to um, everything that we see out there, um, and we want to have the choice uh, whether we want to, how we want to interact with the utility, right? Yes. Long are the days where people really wanted to talk to a live person, right? Or pay the bill by, uh, by mail. I can't remember yeah. the last time I paid the bill by, by mail, right? I can't even remember the last time I bought a stamp, Carlos. That's why the postal office is struggling That's right now. That's exactly right. right. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is the use of technology has brought tremendous advances in technologies that brought tremendous pressures to utilities because regulators are demanding more and more in the way of options and programs mm -hmm. to offer to their customers. And at the same time, they don't want to increase the price that customers pay for the service that you guys provide. Absolutely right. Do more with less. Yeah. Right? On the other side, um, you know, customers are also getting savvy, and they really uh, want more services. Mm -hmm. We talked about reliability. Uh, we talked about having the ability to interact with utilities in an online fashion, right? Correct. By the use of technology. Yep. That's what we typically refer to as the Amazon experience. Correct. Right. So that's some of the trends that we're seeing, that we're seeing in, in, in the industry today. 
Uh, so uh, Forrest, before we actually jump into the rest of the presentation, uh, why don't you tell the audience uh, a little bit about KCPL and, and give us an overview so we Great can see the context for, uh, for so the organization. Kansas, Kansas City Power and Light is a regulated investor-owned utility that was founded in the late 1800s. Uh, we quickly became the energy provider of choice and a resource to the 800,000 plus customers we serve in 47 counties that span the great states of Kansas and Missouri. Kind of giving you some history here, taking you back in time, as part of an ongoing strategy to reduce prices for our customers. In 2008, we purchased another utility named Aquila. Now, while that brought a lot of benefits for us and our customers, it also brought some unique challenges, yep. uh, especially for our employees. I mean, giving you an example, uh, the CSRs, which I'm, I'm not sure if the audience knows what a CSR is. Carl. Customer service rep. It so, basically is the person when you, when, if you, when you call a utility or you know, all their businesses, right? The one that pick up the phone and say, you know, how can I help you? Yeah, they're the, the friendly voices on the other end of the line that have to deal with angry customers, right? Well, those CSRs, they had to navigate over 20 different application screens because we had two separate CIS systems just interact with the customers. And you guys can imagine what kind of inefficiencies and experience that really drove, right? Fast forwarding, bringing you back to 2018, we just recently in June of 2018 went through a merger with a sister utility called Westar Energy. That new company we formed is called Evergy. So throughout this presentation, you may hear us re reference Kansas City Power and Light or KCPL, or simply call it Evergy. But for us, we're one and the same at this point. So today's Forrest and I want to uh, walk you through uh, the one CIS journey. Uh, this is a journey that you and I have been on um, for the last three years, actually working on the journey, yes. but it started way before that. Oh, uh, it started a long time before that. You're absolutely right. right. And, and basically that journey, like I said before, uh, the purpose of that was not only to unify those two different CIS applications, mm -hmm. hence the name one CIS, but it was really more than that. It was a whole comprehensive solution. And I think we're gonna Absolutely. get into uh, a little bit more of the details. And again, the goal of that uh, was to modernize, improve, optimize operations, and also be able to use technology uh, to really offer more choices and be more flexible and be more customer friendly, if you will. Absolutely. Okay, so, um, so Forrest, um, I've sort of explained before you came on stage, um, um, sort of explains at a high level what a CIS is. And I, yeah, think I heard it called a cash register, right? A billing engine, a cash register. Yeah. But um, why don't you tell the audience, you know, from a utility perspective, uh, what is a CIS and why is a CIS important to a utility? Perfect. So a CIS or a customer information system is a critical component to the meter cash value chain for any commodity based utility. Um, the CIS really, what it does, it interlinks your customer information to the metering and consumption process through the billing, payments, and all the other downstream processes that ultimately impact a utility's bottom line. Um, I'll be the first to tell you, from a CIS footprint perspective, they can be fairly small, right? Just really consisting of metering and consumption, payments and billing or it can be extremely robust and complex, much like the solution you and I just delivered with right. the team, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, our solution crossed multi-states, multi-jurisdictions, multi-legal entities. Multi-products. Multi-products. Highly integrated. Highly integrated, based on systems that were almost a quarter of a century old, okay? Okay. So. Um, so obviously, uh, Forrest, I mean, you sort of described the journey and the Aquila's merger and, and where you are today. Um, so your organization has been through, um, through a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, are other utilities also, like your peer utilities when you talk to them, are they also thinking or going through the same, uh, same journey that you guys went through or oh. thinking about replacing their CI solution or you know, putting something new in place? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, what's interesting is the CIS is so crucial in the continuity of that meter to cash process that utilities are consistently assessing and reassessing, looking for the optimal time to do something different with that. 
And it, it really makes most utility COOs and CEOs cringe because when any time you touch a company's cash register, you have all kinds of risk and exposure, which absolutely makes your partnerships crucial in terms of who you're selecting from a software and also from a services provider. Interesting fact, Carlos, and, and I don't know if you know this, but utilities all across the nation, regardless of their geographical borders, share one common trait. What is that, Forrest? It's the fact that our CISs were implemented during the 1980s and, and early 90s, right? And the problem with that is the fact that the technology that was implemented during that era really doesn't support all the options, the dynamic pricing, everything that's being driven by the market, including that customer experience that we demand from the 21st century. So as far as indicating, uh, indicated here, um, you know, techn technology is playing a major part, yeah. right, in some of the decisions you guys are making and some of the evolutions and where, you, where you're heading to. Um, so you, you, we hear a lot of terms out there about, you know, uh, digital revolution, digital transformation, um, and what does that really mean, right? Mm -hmm. It's really using technology. It's really using, um, you know, to really create um, a, a new business model, if you will, or, or change your business model and evolve, mm -hmm. because the reality is uh, technology has changed people's expectations and behavior, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, people wanting to have the Amazon experience, when we talk about folks, you know, wanting to interact with the utilities at their own time, mm -hmm. um, you know, having the choice to actually connect oh, yeah. to this thing called smart devices or phones, right? Yes. Tablets. Uh, the reality is because we can, um, you know, that's the way we want to interact today with, uh, with utilities, right? Absolutely. So, so for so last night, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't sleep because um, I, you know, I, I came from, um, from, from, the, from the East Coast. So by two o'clock in the morning, it's five o'clock for me. Normally I get up at five o'clock. So I went out there and said, you know, I wonder, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the companies that I'm sure you're all gonna be familiar with, um, you know, when did they come into being, right? That's a great when were question. they founded, right? So I'm going to run a couple of names uh, by you here. Um, Google. When do you think Google was founded? Uh, late 90s is what I would guess. 1998. So about 20 years ago. And can you think about functioning today without, without a Google? No. Anytime you need to know anything, what do you do? Well, I'm going to Google it, yeah. right? I mean, they really set the trend in terms of what a search engine could be. Let me throw another one at you, Amazon. Oh, wow. How many people in the audience have an Alexa at home? Right? Yeah. I can't even imagine life without some type of Alexa device or Amazon shopping online. I mean, the fact that I no longer have to leave my house to do a majority of my shopping, lifesaver. 1994, 20, 24 years ago. Wow. Okay. So everybody now, you know, everybody's trying to emulate, you know, that business model type yeah. thing. Uh, let me run a couple more by you. Uh, Uber, which I use all the time. Right. Yep. Completely changed the uh, transportation taxi industry. Yep. I just took an Uber over here. 2009. 2009. Lyft 2012. Facebook 2004. Instagram 2010. Twitter 2006. And the point here is, all these companies, what they had in common, is they really used technology and the power of technology to create a new business model, right? Yeah. And to maybe where no one saw the need they actually saw the need and created a business created model. the business model enabled by technology right let me throw another one at AU that although it was actually uh, founded in 1975 something happened um, that actually changed the way we behave a lot of times Apple oh okay with the iPhone the iPhone was actually introduced in June 29 2007 wow. and think about this device that we all oh, yeah. hate. Love, love or hate relationship, right? right? Hate I can relationship. tell you right now, I mean, that device, I can no longer function without that device. And the reason why I'm saying this, because this is what a lot of the utilities are facing. The new customers, the millennials, the, you know, even, even folks who are, you know, from older generation, that's actually how they want to interact with utilities. And a lot of what we did on the one CIS, mm -hmm. it was actually take advantage of those technologies to, again, improve the customer experience. And when I'm talking about customer, it's not only your external customer, it's also your employees. That's a good right? clarification. Thinking about from the green screens and having to go, Absolutely. you know, so many keystrokes and having to answer a question, right? 
making it a lot easier for them because yeah. at, the, at the end of the day, your employees are also probably your customers, right? Absolutely. So it's making all that uh, better for them. So, so at PwC, even though we are a 169-year-old firm, we also recognize that the world is changing, yeah. right? And we have to evolve and we have to change. Um, and to that end, you know, we started uh, a journey a while back to actually uh, digitize our firm, right? Yep. And not only that, but we also make an investment in our, in our folks to make sure that they get what we call up, their digital skill set upscale. Okay. Because quite frankly, that's what our clients want and what our people expect. Absolutely. And in today's ever-changing technology, digital information that we're dealing with, mm -hmm. We have to do that in order to survive. Absolutely. Right? And that's, I'm sure, is pretty similar to what the utility is going through, right? Yeah, it is. In, fa in fact, from a technology evolution perspective, what you got to realize is that KCPL's CIS systems were almost 25 years old. Um, that's just about a quarter of a century, uh, which from a technology perspective is pretty much prehistoric. I mean, if you think of PC and Internet back in that time frame, um, they were in their infancy stages, right? Surveys indicate that households that actually had a PC during that time frame was less than 40%. And when you look at the combination of households that had an actual PC and internet, well, that cuts to about half, to about 20. Fast forward to today, well, that's somewhere around 80, 85%, if not more. And that's not even including the smart devices you just heard Mr. Bayou here list off. I mean. Technology and the evolution and, and what it's driving us to, it, it's really setting the stage of where we can be. And if we don't react to that, we're going to fall behind. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, so, so Ford is sort of, you know, just painted a picture uh, with words what it was like, you know, 20 years uh, ago operating, you know, in that setting, you know, old technology, mm -hmm. not very efficient. So back then, you know, customers really had lower expectation, right? Yes. And the reality is, there's not much that the, the utility could do there because the infrastructure and technology weren't, was not there. No and, and, no, and if you think about it, I mean, think about 25 years ago, uh, what the process was for a utility. To build, it, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, we would send a meter reader out physically to your house to go in your yard and collect the meter read and then trans that mit, transmit that back to corporate where a fairly simple rate was applied to the usage and bada bing, bada boom, you had a customer bill, right? Well, those days are gone. I mean, if you think about it back then, smart meters and demand response were just buzzwords or they were in their infancy stages, right? I mean, it wasn't until Oracle brought MDM coupled with smart meter technology that that vision became a reality into the market. And because of that, customer expectations have evolved. They've changed. We demand more as consumers. We want it on our timeline, something that's convenient to us when we want to do it. And, and the reality of it is the vast majority of people today don't necessarily want to interact with another human. They want to self-serve when possible. Yep. And that's what, I mean, all the systems, that's what they're trying to do, right? Yes. Uh, provide that, you know, customer touch point. Um, so, so, so anyway, I mean, again, talking about technology and where we are today, where we were 20 years ago, um, this is actually a reflection of the complexity, how complex your, your business is becoming. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of the things that you have to do and you have to invest in technology to make sure that you adjust to those customers' behaviors and expectations because they're not the same as they were no, 20 years ago. No, and every interaction with the customer is scrutinized, right? There's more data, there's more touch points, there's more channels. So, so for us, you know, thinking about our project, right, some of the stuff that we did, um, you know, we use technology now to be able to provide notifications to our customers. Yep. We ask the customers, how do you want to be notified? in case of an event, right? Whether it may be your bill, your bill is ready or, you know, your payment is due. Oh my God, you had, you had an outreach, outreach or, you know, some other yep. conditions, right? What do we do? So we say, do you want it to be communicated via text, via email, or do you want a phone call, right? It was Absolutely. really up to them, yes. you know, how they want to do that. And that's what we accomplished with that. Again, that's an example of using technology 
to meet those customer needs and, 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 and wants in today's world, right? Yeah, in fact, with our solution, if I'm not mistaken, I think we defined somewhere around 50 type yeah, of did. notifications, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Another way, another thing that, uh, that we did is offer, uh, you know, the ability to now build on t based on time of use rates. Oh, absolutely. Right? Um, you know, payment arrangements, you know, all those type of things that maybe before it was a little bit more complex and complicated to offer because of the limitations that you had when it came to technology. Yep. Um, so Forrest, um, um, are there any additional reasons why KCPL decided to um, undertake this uh, transformation? Yeah, so we just kind of covered um, the external forces to the market. We did a recap of technology, the evolution of technology, and then we talked a little bit about customer expectations or chaining. Beyond that, um, within the project's business case, we identified three strategic business outcomes that we committed to. Uh, manage our business was the first one. Well, what does that really mean? It means we need to take advantage of industry best practices. We need to be able to respond to customer expectations. I mean, we have more interactions, more channels, more data. We need to share and become a partner with our customers. And then whatever we do, we know we had to position ourselves for the future. And what that really means is you had, whatever we built and deployed had to be scalable and it had to be highly configurable. So previously I, I had mentioned the merger with Westar Energy and, yep. and the formulation of a new company called Evergy. I, I want you to put that in a parking lot. I just talked about a scalable and configurable solution. I want you to put that in a parking lot too and we'll come back to those later. We'll come back to that. So, so, so Forrest, I know you've been on this journey now for, uh, for a while. It just didn't happen overnight, right? There was a lot of work. There was a lot of strategy that went into it. Um, uh, and actually, although the project technically, what we call the 1CIS started in, um, in 2016, there's a lot of stuff that happened before then. So why don't you tell yeah. us a little bit about um, how the one CIS fit into the whole uh, roadmap that, um, that the company had? It's a good question, Carlos. Uh, KCPL went into this thing eyes wide open. We did a lot of research on this type of project. I mean, again, these are the type of projects CEOs and CEOs really don't want to take on unless it's absolutely necessary simply because of the risk profile associated with the project. Um, we partnered with PwC and we partnered with Oracle, which really provided a, us a lot of insight on potential levers we could pull to help position us in a better spot for success. Um, at the end of the day, what we realized is that there were certain applications we could put in pre-program that could help de-risk the project. So that's kind of what this roadmap shows. I mean, we started back way back in 2011 were right. some of the conversations. I think 2011 you started the uh, One Mobile. Correct. Again, talks about uh, your field operations and modernizing the way you uh, interacted and work out in the field. Uh, Sabre was more about uh, financial transformation. Mm -hmm. That's when you put in um, uh, your PeopleSoft uh, HR and financials. Correct. Place. And then if we look uh, you know, closer to, um, uh, to the 2015 uh, timeline, um, there are major events in there with the, uh, with the MDM. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the MDM and what that is? Yeah, so uh, the MDM, meter data management, it, it's really what uh, takes care of all your usage or collects all the usage and then sends that to the billing engine to calculate the billing. And that's also attached to your smart meters, Correct. To your smart grid, and when we start talking about that, now we see the evolution in technology, right? Absolutely, and if you think about it from a customer perspective, whether you're commercial or residential, I mean, what MDM does and, and the smart meters really do is it provides interval usage data to you as a customer. So next time you flip on that washer or dryer and you wanna see what it's doing to your bill, you can actually go take a look and see the spike, right? You can calculate the cost of that based on the pricing we're showing you. What it's doing is allowing the customer to take control of their own destiny from a usage standpoint, to help educate them and give them the tools to instill change. And not only that, but also from a utility point of view, right, when you have a smart meter out there and you have the technology, mm -hmm. now you can be proactive instead of reactive, right? Yes. You can ping that meter, you know whether uh, it's operational or not, and even before even people find out there's a problem with the meter, you can, you can go out there, send somebody out there to correct the problem, or sometimes you can even fix it remotely. That is Not correct. only that, but you can also uh, 
turn it on and turn it off. Turn it off, that's right. That's exactly right, which, which is interesting because back in the day, for anyone that's in the audience that remembers when meter readers came into your yard, I mean, there was always two things you worried about when you got a call from the utility during that time. Unlock the door and make sure you put away the dog. That's exactly right, right? Was that gate unlocked? Is Fido put up? Yeah. Every time. That's no longer an issue. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, let's move on to, um, you know, the old way uh, versus the new way. So <laughs> you want to talk about this? Yeah, I, I love this slide. So this became a standing joke on the project. Uh, it doubled as an eye chart. If you could read this thing from 15 feet away, you're golden. Um, what it really is, though, is it's a picture of our legacy architecture for the project. Um, you can see on each side of the divide there, the green divide, you have a CIS system on each side. You had a legacy KCPL, and then you had Aquilas. And all the lines in between really speak to the inefficiencies and redundancies that were required. And the inefficiencies just weren't on the IT side. I mean, don't get me wrong, anytime you tried to make a change in legacy, I mean, it became custom code, right? Because the applications were so old, the vendors no longer supported them. Well, that only increased the risk profile, especially on the security side. Additionally, you had increased maintenance costs. And then the impacts to the business side. I mean, we talked about the CSRs having to navigate over 20 different screens, and, and one of them was a green screen or DOS-based screen. What about training? Oh, training. Because you had two different systems, you had to spend somewhere between 12 to 16 weeks training one CSR before you could put them on the phone to take calls. I mean, that, that's three to four months investment in someone before you even put them to work. And as far as one of the things that we did, right, to uh, help with that process during mm -hmm. the project, uh, you guys actually uh, on, own Oracle UPK, so all the program right now is a digital training program. Absolutely it is. And you can change it in one place and it changes everywhere. Across the board. And so what's the uh, training time now for, for a new CSR? I, I can tell you right now, I mean, it, it's been cut in about half is what it has. We think we're going to get more efficiencies out of that, but we've, we've also unlocked a lot of new functionality too, so there may be a lot more to train our folks on, but it has at least cut it in half. So, so Forrest just painted a picture, you know, what it was like, um, you know, 10 years, well, not even 10 years ago, back in, we were still <laughs> operating that century, way. Yeah. We went live uh, 2018, right? Yep. Um, so, uh, I mean, if you guys think about, um, and some of us have been around for a while, um, you know, the old green screen, what we used to call it, green screen, mm -hmm. and how we take multiple keys and you know, keystrokes and tab and function keys and everything else, yeah. just to be able to answer one question. Correct. That's what you guys were, uh, were dealing with, right? That's tab, 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 F9, oh, let me find it, nope, tab, tab, tab. That's exactly what they had to do while customers are on the phone. Yeah which increases handling time and wait times, right? And that translates into inefficiencies. Oh, absolutely. Uh, customers are not satisfied because they have to be on hold forever, mm -hmm. right? So again, this is some of, some of the things that we try to change with the introduction, introduction of, of the one CIS. Um, so, so Forrest, um, um, what can you tell us uh, uh, of why um, why KCPL actually selected Oracle as a technology platform uh, to embark on this journey? I can. Um, from a utility perspective, and I'm assuming everyone in the audience knows this, uh, when it comes to billing, there's only really two top tier providers out there, uh, SAP and Oracle. And KCPL was looking for something much more robust than just a software provider. Uh, we wanted a service provider. We wanted an advisor. Really, we wanted an overarching strategic partner. And wow, when I hear myself say all that, it sounds like we're on the search for that mythical purple unicorn, doesn't it? No pun intended, we got purple shirts here. I oh, didn't realize that, good call. Um, the reality of it was, is we had a lot of Oracle software already. I mean, we, we talked about the two legacy CIS systems. Those were uh, Oracle's. Um, we had PeopleSoft for financials and we were using Primavera and Unifier on large construction to manage both cost and schedule. And then there was probably a slew of other databases in the background, right, Basically, that were Oracle-based. Oracle platform. Um, so it, it really made a lot of sense for KCPL to head down the path with Oracle and further the relationship based on what they had already done for us to date. 
And the reality of it is, is from an Oracle lens, Oracle was with us much like PwC lockstep throughout the entire project, providing us overarching design advice, making sure that from a technology and product perspective, we weren't doing anything to degrade any functionality that may show up in a future roadmap. And then they had solution architects reviewing our stuff to make sure that at the end of the day, we were using the products as they were intended to be used. Yep. And that's a great segue for the next slide. Um, this is just a, a picture here uh, representing just the major components of the 1CI mm -hmm. solution. It's not everything, right? Correct. Because we're missing in there the uh, financials on the back end. Uh, we're missing in there the, the intelligent, the, the reporting engine, uh, which is OUA and, and Oracle BI type of thing. So, but what I want to illustrate here, uh, to your point, um, and you talked about earlier about, you know, some CI solutions are more complex than others. I would say that probably your solution ranks up there when it comes to complexity. Think about all these systems having to work together. Uh, when we think about the number of real-time interfaces and integrations oh, yeah. that we have to put together, and the effort and the amount of work and the number of hours and the number of people that went into it, mm -hmm. So here, I just want to highlight that out of the um, nine products that I have there on the board, six of those were actually um, Oracle application. They were either already in place or were actually deployed as part of the one CI solution. But even if they were already in place, they were not really talking to each other. Yeah, 100%. they're siloed off. And there was a lot of work actually uh, to integrate it and make it work as one solution. Again, that's why we also call it the one CI solution because it was beyond just unifying and bringing together those CIS system is really putting an entire solution uh, um, together. Interesting fact here on this one, the three items that are grayed out, this was something else Oracle provided for us. I mean, they helped recommend whether their software suite would actually meet our business objectives. And where they didn't believe it would, they didn't try and sell us the product. I mean, they, they actually recommended other products. A lot of that was based on how heavily customized yeah. some of our stuff is based on the regulatory requirements of our states. Um, and, and that's the case of the uh, CSS, or the Customer Self Service Portal. Correct. I mean, you guys had a very sophisticated uh, customer portal. Yeah. Not only used for your residential customer, but pr primarily it was used for the, uh, and it is used today, uh, for the CNI customers. And we looked out there, um, equivalent products off the shelf. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that came near uh -huh. to the functionality you had. So you made strategic decision to say, okay, we're gonna keep it. We're just gonna replatform, um, you know, refresh the technology and make sure that it gets integrated in there. Not only did you keep the uh, existing functionality, but we added, added some enhancements to that, right? Yep. And one of them that I can, you know, um, name, me, uh, quick, um, name quickly is the interaction between your portal and your um, uh, Oracle CX, right? Which mm -hmm. is another one that we introduced about halfway through the project. Yep. And this is the one that really allows us to uh, send notifications based on operational events to our customers and sort of personalize that touch between the utility and the customer. Agreed. Okay. Um, so Forrest, uh, why don't you tell the audience how the program, how you were able to manage uh, scope uh, on such a large uh, scale uh, program with uh, so many organizations who were involved, so many vendors and, uh, and so many people in the organization working on it. Yeah, so how many people in the audience have ever been engaged on a project that is, has experienced scope creep? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's what I thought. A lot of hands in the air. Uh, if I had a magic recipe, I, I would bottle it and sell it to you on how to fix that problem. But the reality is, is there's nothing magical to do it. Um, we, KCPL, had a pretty seasoned PMO. Uh, and PricewaterhouseCoopers brought a very seasoned PMO to the table as well. We both agreed that stakeholder alignment is critical. And setting expectations or defining what does good look like is key to a successful program. And that's really what this page represents, which is the guiding principles for us. We establish guiding principles to become the guardrails to help us drive decisions and move off dead center. What you're gonna find out if you ever try and take on a transformation like this is you're going to make hundreds if not thousands of decisions that not only impact your business on a daily basis, 
but also impact the technology side, right? And we use these guardrails to help keep us in the green and not stall out because I will tell everyone in this room the thing that will delay your project faster than anything is indecision. And with a solution this large and this complex, I mean, you're touching every aspect of the company, which means all those silos that exist, you have to break them down and integrate the departments to get this objective complete. And that's not easy. No, it's not it's easy a at big all. Challenge. It is a very, very big challenge. Okay, so that's a great segue uh, because here the next slide uh, talks about, so you guys can get an idea of the magnitude of, of the program and, and the objects and mm -hmm. what was generated. This really speaks to um, uh, the amount of work and effort uh, that went into actually designing, developing, testing, and deploying the solution. So we like to call this uh, uh, CIS or paint by paint the by the numbers. That's right. So um, is there anyone in there you want to that you want to pick up and talk about? So here's what I'd tell the audience. I I've been with Kansas City Power and Light um, going on probably uh, 15 years, right about there. Um, I have tracked over five billion dollars worth of projects spanning generation, transmission, distribution, air quality control. Uh, this deployment was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, it was also the most rewarding. And when I look at this page, I mean, each one of these boxes means something special to me. But when I look at the man hours, and by the way, those are just direct man hours. Those don't include all the indirects, PMO, that, that type of thing. I mean, you can almost build a new unit, 850 megawatt unit for those man hours, which really speaks to the complexity of the solution. The one that catches my eye for us is the one at the bottom there, 28,000 test cases. <laughs> Close to 30,000 test cases, Carlos. We tested the heck out of it. Oh, us. yes, we did. I, I think we spent just about a year Close, running tests, Close to right? a year when everything was said and done. And, yeah. and every time we got there, said, can we test a little bit more? Can That's we right. test a little bit more? That's pretty amazing. I mean, we did all kinds of testing, um, you know, whether it was component functional testing, so multiple uh, rounds of system integration testing, yeah. operational readiness, you name it. Uh, we did it. Uh, my, my wife tells me I still have night terrors, wake up screaming, I found a defect. So <laughs> I remember testing quite well, Carlos. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I'd point out, uh, those two items I asked you to put on your parking lot, right? Um, 3,000 requirements. So talked about Westar, talked about Evergy, right, the merger. Talked about the fact that we needed to build something that was scalable and highly configurable. Well, I can tell you, from a Evergy perspective, when we go to look at the pulling legacy Westar's CIS into ours, we are looking at something much, 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 much smaller in terms of requirements. Why? Because we achieved our goal. We built a quality solution, deployed it, and made it scalable and highly configurable, right. which is exactly what the end game was. Yep, 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 yep. So uh, we're running out of time here, so why don't we jump into uh, top lessons learned? Oh, okay. Um, from top lessons learned perspective, I mean, Carlos and I struggled with this slide a little bit. I mean, the reality of it is, is we have hundreds upon hundreds of lessons learned. But really, that's the benefit you get with partnering with people like Oracle and PricewaterhouseCoopers is that experience. And we basically agree, okay, let, let's pick the five that really go across industries. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think the ones that, these are the ones that we came up with. Um, I cannot stress how important it is from day one to make sure you have active executive sponsorship and support. Set in tone from they the top. Set the tone. As a matter of fact, I remember when we kick off the program, you know, you and I were not involved. It was the executive sponsors that actually set out, you know, basically set out the program and Correct. talked about the importance to the company of being successful and what it meant for, uh, for, for the utility in the company. Absolutely. Um, the other one, um, and you heard me say this a thousand times, um, technology is easy, right? Yep. Uh, technology has been proven. Uh, that's not a big deal. What is really difficult is really uh, sticking to your business transformation. Absolutely. Because that implies people have to change behaviors. Agreed, and you know how much people, yes, yeah, right. you, you know how much we like to change, right? I mean, this gets back to the, the fact that the technology has been proven time and time again. Where you will lose the battle on these projects 
it really starts to tie into the next bullet, establish, establishing operational readiness governance. Mm -hmm. To us, that's the PMO, that's OCM, organizational change management, and it's training. Each one of those represents a leg on a three-legged stool. And if you don't put effort into that in educating people why we need to change, you'll never get there. Absolutely. I think we talked enough about uh, testing and how much testing we did. Yeah. Uh, the other one that we also want to highlight is something that a lot, of, a lot of companies overlook, and they start thinking about really having a strong production support model Absolutely. towards the end of the project, but you really should tackle that. Uh, should at the define of the that on the front end, right? right? Which really comes down to you got to make sure you understand who your subject matter experts are and that knowledge transfer occurs throughout the entire project. What you don't want to do is wait to get the end to figure out you don't have a post-production support model that can actually run and administer this. Yep. So I think, I think that's the end of our presentation for us. Uh, we have about uh, three minutes and 25 seconds. Um, you know, we can probably take uh, one or two questions if there are any questions out there. Uh, but again, this is, here's our contact information. Um, if you have any questions, then something that you're really passionate about, you want to know, you want to find out. Yeah, just reach out. Here's our contact information. Feel free to reach out to that.